Welcome ladies and gentlemen once more to the Adventures in History Land YouTube channel. Today is a very special day because I'm joined by the the inestimable Brandon F from the Brandon F YouTube channel. Thank you very much sir, it's a pleasure to be here. And today we are going, it's a very, it's a very exciting day for me because we get to talk about the American Revolution and uh, specifically today we're going to be talking about the Boston Massacre. Uh, so we're going to be digging into some of the original sources to help give a impression of what happened. See if we can't sort out some uh, some fact and fiction, some uh, overblown accounts versus some that are a little bit more uh, well grounded, as it were. Yes, the Boston Massacre. Uh, first of all, is a very inflammatory title. Uh, yes, very much so. Three were killed on the spot and. Uh, two died later or something, April. wasn't it? Yeah. So, so it cost the lives of five people in total and uh, numerous other injuries. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a famous trial featuring uh, the well-known figure John Adams, uh, who defended the Redcoats in this case, or helped defend the Redcoats, I should say. Uh, and because of this trial that occurred later in the year 1770, there is a wealth of information that is available for people to uh, look at and study mm -hmm. uh, on this matter. Uh, the trial itself hinges a lot on the commanding officer, uh, the instigating officer uh, of the event, uh, Captain Thomas Preston of uh, His Majesty's 29th Regiment of Foot. And therefore, that's where, uh, that's where we're going to begin, by reading through his account, using that as a basis, and then informing it with some of the other accounts. Yeah. It is a matter of too great notoriety to need any proofs that the arrival of His Majesty's troops in Boston was extremely obnoxious to his inhabitants. They have ever used all means in their power to weaken the regiments and to bring them into contempt by promoting and aiding desertions and with impunity even where there has been the clearest evidence of the fact and by grossly and falsely propagating untruths concerning them. On the arrival of the 64th and 65th, their ardor seemingly began to abate, it being too expensive to buy off so many and attempts of that kind rendered too dangerous from the numbers. But the spirit revived immediately on its being known that those regiments were ordered for Halifax, and hath ever since their departure been breaking out with greater violence. After their embarkation, one of their justices, not thoroughly acquainted with the people and their intentions, on the trial of the 14th Regiment, openly and publicly in the hearing of great numbers of people, and from the seat of justice, declared that the soldiers must now take care of themselves, nor trust too much to their arms, for they were but a handful, and the inhabitants carried weapons concealed under their clothes, and would destroy them in a moment if they pleased. This, considering the malicious temper of the people, was an alarming circumstance to the soldiery, since which several disputes have happened between the townspeople and soldiers of both regiments, and the former being encouraged thereto by the countenance of even some of the magistrates and by the protection of all the party against government. In general, such disputes have been kept too secret from the officers. On the second instance, two of the 29th going through one Gray's rope walk, the rope makers insultingly asked them if they would empty a vault. This unfortunately had the desired effect by provoking the soldiers, and from words they went to blows. Both parties suffered in this affray, and finally the soldiers retired to their quarters. The officers, on the first knowledge of this transaction, took every precaution in their power to prevent any ill consequences. Notwithstanding which, single quarrels could not be prevented. The inhabitants constantly provoking and abusing the soldiery. The insolence as well as utter hatred of the inhabitants to the troops increased daily, insomuch that Monday and Tuesday, the 5th and 6th instant, were privately agreed on for a general engagement, in consequence of which several of the militia came from the country armed to join their friends, menacing to destroy any who should oppose them. 
This plan has since been discovered. On Monday night, about 8 o'clock, two soldiers were attacked and beat. But the party of the townspeople, in order to carry matters to the utmost length, broke into two meeting houses and rang the alarm bells, which I supposed was for fire, as usual, but was soon undeceived. About nine some of the guard came to and informed me the town inhabitants were assembling to attack the troops, and that the bells were ringing as the signal for that purpose, and not for fire, and the beacon intended to be fired to bring in the distant people of the country. This, as I was captain of the day, occasioned my repairing immediately to the main guard. In my way there, I saw the people in great commotion and heard them use the most cruel and horrid threats against the troops. In a few minutes after I reached the guard, about a hundred people passed it and went towards the custom house where the king's money is lodged. They immediately surrounded the sentinel posted there and with clubs and other weapons threatened to execute their vengeance on him. I was soon informed by a townsman their intention was to carry off the soldier from his post and probably murder him, on which I desired him to return for further intelligence, and he soon came back and assured me that he heard the mob declare they would murder him. This, I feared, might be a prelude to the plundering the king's chest. I immediately sent a non-commissioned officer and twelve men to protect both the sentinel and the king's money, and very soon followed myself to prevent, if possible, all disorder fearing lest the officer and soldiery, by the insults and provocation of the rioters, should be thrown off their guard and commit some rash act. They soon rushed through the people, and by charging their bayonets in half-circle, kept them at a little distance. Nay, so far was I intending the death of any person, that I suffered the troops to go to the spot where the unhappy affair took place, without any loading in their pieces, nor did I ever give orders for loading them. This remiss conduct in me perhaps merits censure, yet it is evidence, resulting from the nature of things, which is best and surest that can be offered, that my intention was not to act offensively, but the contrary part, and that not without compulsion. The mob still increased and were more outrageous, striking their clubs or bludgeons one against another and calling out, Come on, you rascals, you bloody backs, you lobster scoundrels, fire if you dare. God damn you, fire and be damned, we know you dare not. And much more such language was used. At this time, I was between the soldiers and the mob, parlaying with and endeavoring all in my power to persuade them to retire peaceably, but to no purpose. They advanced to the point of the bayonets, struck some of them, and even the muzzles of the pieces, and seemed to be endeavoring to close with the soldiers. On which some well-behaved persons asked me if the guns were charged. I replied, yes. They then asked me if I intended to order the men to fire. I answered, no, by no means. Observing to them that I was advanced before the muzzles of the men's pieces, and must fall a sacrifice if they fired. That the soldiers were upon the half-cock and charged bayonets, and my giving the word fire under those circumstances would prove me no officer. While I was thus speaking, one of the soldiers, having received a severe blow with a stick, stepped a little out to one side and instantly fired, on which turning to and asking him why he fired without orders, I was struck with a club on my arm, which for some time deprived me of the use of it. Which blow, had it been placed on my head, most probably would have destroyed me. On this, general attack was made on the men by a great number of heavy clubs and snowballs being thrown at them, by which all our lives were in imminent danger. Some persons at the time, from behind, calling out, Damn your bloods! Why don't you fire? Instantly, three or four of the soldiers fired, one after another, and directly after, three more in the same confusion and hurry. The mob then ran away, except three unhappy men who instantly expired, in which number was Mr. Gray, at whose rope walk the prior quarrel took place. One more in since dead, three others are dangerously and four slightly wounded. The whole of this melancholy affair was transacted in almost twenty minutes. On my asking the soldiers why they fired without orders, they said they heard the word fire and supposed it came from me. This might be the case, as many of the mob called out, fire, fire, but I assured the men that I gave no such order, that my words were, don't fire, stop your firing. In short, it was scarce possible for the soldiers to know who said fire, or don't fire, or stop your firing. On the people's assembling again to take away the dead bodies, the soldiers, supposing them coming to attack them, 
were making ready to fire again, which I prevented by striking up their firelocks with my hand. Immediately after, a townsman came and told me that four or five thousand people were assembled in the next street and had sworn to take my life with every man's with me, on which I judged it unsafe to remain there any longer and therefore sent the party and sentry to the main guard, where the street is narrow and short, there telling them off into street firings, divided and planted them at each end of the street to secure their rear, momently expecting an attack as there was a constant cry of the inhabitants. To arms, to arms, take out your guns, and the town drums beating to arms. I ordered my drum to beat to arms, and being soon after joined by the different companies of the 29th Regiment, I formed them as the guard into street firings. The 14th Regiment also got under arms, but remained at their barracks. I immediately sent a sergeant with a party to Colonel Dalyrimple, the commanding officer, to acquaint him with every particular. Several officers going to join their regiment were knocked down by the mob, one very much wounded, and his sword taken from him. The Lieutenant Governor and Colonel Carr soon met at the head of the 29th Regiment and agreed that the regiment should retire to their barracks, and the people to their houses. But I kept the picket to strengthen the guard. It was with great difficulty that the Lieutenant Governor prevailed on the people to be quiet and retire. At last, they all went off, excepting about a hundred. A council was immediately called, the breaking up of which three justices met, and issued a warrant to apprehend me and eight soldiers. On hearing this procedure, I instantly went to the sheriff and surrendered myself, though for the space of four hours I had it in my power to have made my escape, which I most undoubtedly should have attempted, and could have easily executed, had I been the least conscious of any guilt. On the examination before the justices, two witnesses swore that I gave the men orders to fire. The one testified he was within two feet of me, the other that I swore at the men for not firing at the first word. Others swore they heard me use the word fire, but whether do or do not fire they could not say. Others that they heard the word fire, but could not say if it came from me. The next day they got five or six more to swear I gave the word to fire. So bitter and inveterate are many of the malcontents here that they are industriously using every method to fish out evidence to prove it was a concerted scheme to murder the inhabitants. Others are infusing the utmost malice and revenge into the minds of the people who are to be my jurors by false publications, votes of towns, and all other artifices, that so from a settled rancor against the officers and troops in general, the suddenness of my trial after the affair, while the people's minds are all greatly inflamed, I am, though perfectly innocent, under most unhappy circumstances, having nothing in reason to expect but the loss of life in a very ignominious manner, without the interposition of His Majesty's royal goodness. Boston Jail, Monday, 12th March, 1770. So yes, Captain Preston, a very, very heavy testimony, uh, and speaking to an awful lot of the, um, really, I think a lot of the, the traditional narrative. You know, uh, oftentimes, at least here in the United States, the Boston Massacre is kind of taught as, uh, you know, tensions were rising, and then they came to an absolute head when this thing happened. But immediately, the thing that first struck me, really, is that right off of the bat, we have Preston not just, you know, going to the day itself, but he is providing us with a history, a, a rather lengthy history, going back to when the regiments first arrived, saying, look, there has been so much violence before, and none of this ever happened, you know, we never had trials or not before, because of all you people trying to stifle it as much as possible, and us trying to limit the damage. But, but this is hardly a new occasion. There have been numerous instances of officers and soldiers being provoked in the streets, of being outright attacked in the streets. How, uh, from the very beginning, when the regiments are arriving, the people are despising their presence and doing everything they can, uh, including, you know, um... Uh, trying to buy people off to to basically convince the population that the army is there for nefarious purposes. Um, it, it, it's fascinating how he's trying to sort of get ahead of not only the event, but the entirety of the narrative and take control of it, portraying this as, um, you know, not so much, you know, an absolute head of events, but just one more event in which the crown soldiers, even if they acted improperly, are ultimately being victimized by a much wider, a much more uh, controlling population, as it were.
uh, it really seems like he uh, is, is describing it almost like uh, a kind of a gang war yeah, situation exactly. in the streets. Uh, yeah, where it's, it's not like a policing force and the civilian population. It is like armed mob versus, you know, righteous soldiery. It's a very clear moral like dichotomy that he's posing. And even on the day of the, the massacre, in, in quotes, massacre, uh, you have um, something called the Cornhill Affray, which happens uh, yes. that, that, um, that evening, I think, and uh, where, which is a direct result of the, that, that affair at the rope walk that he spoke of, at Gray's rope, rope Walk. And there uh, are interesting testimonies that describe those events, Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe not putting them into a great con a great uh, a greater context as Preston does, but certainly illustrate the the tensions and just j gives a kind of a glimpse of the day to day goings on between these these mob the, this this mob that he describes mm -hmm. um, that hate the soldiers so much mm -hmm. uh, and the soldiers who um, you know whoever whoever throws the first punch someone's going to throw the punch throw another throw a punch back and the yeah, soldiers are exactly. really quite happy um to to go on their own account out mm -hmm. and and uh, i don't know avenge their honor or something like yeah, that yeah and and, and and to meet i suppose the domestic population on this same level of violence uh, yeah. both both sides are willing to escalate as much as they feel they need to as it were which is you know kind of the most unfortunate you know, fact in the entire thing when neither side is really trying to lower tensions, yeah. but the, each side is being stoked up. Is like you know these are the enemy and everything, but you know we yeah. can go off on that for hours. I'm sure. I know. I wonder if it speaks a little to the state of the British Army at the time um, as well that the officers don't appear to either want or seem to find it within their power to to stop members of the regiments in in Boston uh, going out and fighting. Basically, yeah, I think it's um, you know it speaks an awful lot, I'm sure, to the inexperience of the army at that particular time. You know, uh, a lot of the officers, you know, may, might be coming from a very long and and uh, and proud history of serving and whatnot. But most of these soldiers have never actually seen combat. They've never seen an enemy of any kind. Um, and presumably, uh, I'm not entirely sure on the statistics, but I should imagine that a lot of the non-commissioned officers are kind of in the same boat. This, as far as their occupation of Boston is concerned, this is the most hostile territory that they've ever been in. So they don't have something that they can compare this to when it comes like, oh, no, no, when I was in France, oh, it was way worse because that was an actual, that was a hostile, you know, population. These are our countrymen. The officers might realize, like, oh, no, these are our people, but... But the soldiery themselves have no real basis for, for that comparison, I should imagine. Um, and, you know, it, it, the, the proud tradition of the British Army being that all discipline really does fall to the NCOs and the officers are above such paltry matters and whatnot. Um, you know, I imagine that that's going to play an effect, that even if the officers were trying to limit it, how much power do they really have uh, socially and literally to actually make that happen? Uh, but then, of course, as you say as well, as it is, the officers seem hardly inclined to do so. So that's just going to make the entire situation, you know, even worse. Um, as well, actually, one particular uh, phrase here I think is rather rather interesting as far as the um, the affair at, at Gray's Rope Walk. After uh, the two soldiers of the 29th foot are just, you know, going by the area on what business, who knows? They probably, you know, have their bayonets with them. They probably have forage caps or whatever. If they're just going about some business, they're not under arms. Uh, and then two men, or two men? No, no sorry, uh, a number of men. The rope makers, it says. Uh, the the um, Preston doesn't mention how many of them there are. He just says, uh, they start provoking the soldiers. They start asking, oh, are you, are you going to go rob someplace? Are you going to go and empty a vault? Are you going to go about some mischief? And then the exact, the exact words that I have um, from Preston say, this unfortunately had the desired effect by provoking the soldiers, and from words they went to blows. Which is rather curious, because... Now, uh, perhaps we might say that a more level approach to this is, okay, we have two soldiers walking by, we have civilians accosting them and shouting at them, insulting them. And then the, and the soldiers who are provoked tend, seem to be, at least it's implied, are the ones to instigate the violence itself. Now, 
it, it might be a very 21st century uh, ideal here, but generally speaking, and it, the way that he phrases it seems to tell me that it's kind of the same way here, is that um, the soldiers should be expected to be held to a higher standard than that. That if they're the ones to throw the first punch, they're kind of the ones who are in the wrong here. But what, what Preston is doing is he's saying that first off, that was the desired effect. So it wasn't just that the, the rope makers were, you know, act, you know with, with bravado and puffing their chest out and be like, oh yeah, you guys get out of here, you know, trying to like, you know, act all manly and throw them off. But rather they were trying actively like, get them to throw the first punch. We can make them look like the bad guys. We can do the, you know, we'll get them to attack us. And then he immediately follows it up, Preston does, by saying both parties suffered in this affray and finally the soldiers retired to their quarters. So, so, okay, yes, what we have here is a situation in which the soldiers were accosted and then they attack, but hold on now. What really happened, these guys were trying to get them to throw a punch, and when they did, everyone suffered as a result. He's taking what could potentially be seen as a one-sided affair, and he's attempting to entirely flip it on its back and make it still one-sided, but in the other direction, which is fascinating. And again, it, it speaks to the level of escalating violence on both sides as neither one is really willing to back down, as it were, in this occupation. He, the, way he, the way he describes it seems to absolutely support the fact that if a soldier goes out in the street in Boston at this time, they're going to get abused or something yeah. like that, uh, if not physically, then verbally. Mm -hmm. And um, and, and verbally with the express intent of later visiting physical harm on them as well. Indeed, because this is all to do with the quartering acts and mm -hmm. things like that, isn't it? Uh, which allow British troops to uh, be garrisoned inside towns and on uh, yeah. civilian po property and things like that, mm -hmm. which is very common in Britain. And yeah. there is trouble. Yeah, particularly on the event. Irish establishment, if, yeah. I'm, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Uh, and... So this is the, that's that's where the Bostonians are coming from. They they don't accept that this is a necessary thing to happen and the soldiers should be out of town because they feel they're troublemakers. On the <laughs> other hand, this, as you were saying before, the soldiers, on the other hand, who have no experience of a population that is actually willing to try and provoke a fight to get them kicked mm. out of a town. At, at least nothing presumably to this standard. Again, you, you can probably expect some level of, uh, you know, tension, say, on the Irish establishment, or even if it's Irish establishment soldiers in England, perhaps Irish soldiers in England, you know, that they as well are probably going to have some tension. But, but this is probably, this is an, another level, is the thing, because it doesn't usually come to to deaths, I think is a big thing. It might come to like blows in a pub or something like that back at home, but never actually shooting, never, you know, beatings that are so severe. As That's an entirely different thing, uh, entirely. The, the in, troops in the aid of civil power is a very regulated thing. Regimental mm -hmm. officers really aren't even allowed to open fire on, on civilians without a magistrate present. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, uh, we might get it. We might be able to cover it later. But um, when the lieutenant governor arrives, as Preston says at the end, one uh, there's a there's an account that says that when he arrived, a different account. Uh, it's uh, he. One of the first things he asks is, "Who's the officer who ordered the shooting, and why did he shoot without a magistrate's permission?" And so, going back to the 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 fight at the rope walk, which Preston seems to to use as not the first incident that provokes mm. the the affair on King Street, um, but uh, certainly certainly the the one that that is most responsible for the the very quick escalation uh, that march. The one that most that most predates, so to yeah. say. Yeah, the the details of that are interesting when you look at some of the depositions of the the, the witnesses. Now there are a couple of these. Um, one of the most interesting, uh, one, the, some are more detailed than others. One of them talks about the fact that the two soldiers in question, they began the fight and were uh, were chased off hmm. quicker than and that they came. the soldiers began the fight. Uh, yes, and they were beaten off because there was a lot more rope makers than soldiers. Hmm. But the soldiers went off and got some of the, their mates and came back. Hmm. And this is where um, a gentleman uh, called John Hill takes up uh, uh, takes up a narrative, and he says that after after identifying himself as a man of sixty nine etc. says that in the forenoon of Friday the second of March current, I was at a house 
the corner of a passageway leading from Atkinson Street to Mr. John Gray's rope walks near Green's Barracks, so called. When I saw eight or ten soldiers pass the window with clubs, I immediately got up and went to the door and found them returning from the rope walks to the barracks, whence they again very speedily reappeared, now increased to the number of 30 or 40 armed with clubs and other weapons. In this latter company was a tall Negro drummer, to whom I called, you black rascal, what have you to do with white people's quarrels? He answered, I suppose I may look on, and went forward. I went out directly and commanded the peace, telling them I was in commission. But they not regarding me, knocked down a rope maker in my presence, and two or three of them beating him with clubs. I endeavoured to relieve him. But on approaching the fellows who were mauling him, one of them with a great club struck at me with such violence that had I not happily avoided it, might have been fatal to me. The party last mentioned rushed in towards the rope walks and, uh, and attacked the rope makers nigh on the tar kettle, but were soon beat off, drove out of the passageway by which they entered and were followed by the rope makers, whom I persuaded to go back and they readily obeyed, and further I say not. Very interesting then, because with with uh, with the one account that we get from Preston, um, you know, having having not studied this event particularly bef before this, you know, when I hear Preston speak as a very military man, and, he, and again, he's a very intelligent man. Clearly, he's very much trying to direct this narrative in a way that supports what he's saying. He makes it out to be okay. So you have two soldiers walking down the street. They start getting insulted. Now, admittedly, they attack after being insulted. What I imagine, as I literally said to you earlier, was, oh, okay, so these are two soldiers. They're probably, you know, not under arms, so no muskets. They probably have their bayonets with them because that's just sort of military custom. At least a lot of people like Bennett Cuthbertson write about how um, a soldier should always, yeah, always have his sword belt or bayonet with him. Um, and then probably their forage caps, um, you know, not their, not their cocked hats and all, all that sort of thing. I have a very particular image in my mind of how this brawl takes place. Yeah, they're probably actually, you know, exchanging fisticuffs. They're just beating each other. All of a sudden here we have a dramatic escalation that, you know, just reading the Preston account, there's no hint of. Like, okay, well yeah, all that was the case, but then after those soldiers left because, you know, there are a lot more of us than there were of them and they kind of got embarrassed or they kind of got shamed, uh, they come back with what? They said 30 or 40 individuals, was it? <laughs> yeah, actually, it was something like that, wasn't it? Yeah, it let's was, see. let's see, it was... So I saw eight or ten soldiers pass the window with clubs. I immediately got up and went to the door. Yeah, 30 uh, or 40. <laughs> and armed with clubs and other weapons, which is, is a dramatically different image, first off. Yes, we have now a mob of 30 or 40 men. That is, at full strength, that's a company. That is a subdivision of soldiers. That's like, hey, everyone, we're going. And they're all like, okay, sure. And they take off with them. And they uh, bring their drum in. Apparently. And they even bring their drummer, who's just kind of like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll watch, sure, why not? Um, at least, yeah, it, uh... I'm curious as to whether he's a particularly imposing man, because another account mm -hmm. describes him as a very tall drummer. Interesting. I mean, that would make sense, you know, given, um, it, it specifically does describe, and, you know, odds are, just given the time period, they would point out, oh, and also this guy was black, just because that's important for the time period. Um, <laughs> but, it, but it was very common, you know, the fact that he's a black drummer is very interesting, because... Uh, as you are well aware, in the 18th century, the musicians were um, were very much a uh, bit of a show as far as regimental colonels were concerned. Like they would pour in so much time and money to making sure that they have like the most, for lack of a better word, uh, exotic musicians as far as their dress, as far as their customs and whatnot, because that's just sort of the fashion of the time period. So. Um, you know, so black men often were used as musicians because it was seen as more, ooh, more Eastern, more exotic, more foreign, whatever, however you want to phrase it. it again, it was just the times. Um, and, and so, and oftentimes as well, soldiers and other men are selected purely on instance of height and strength and other physical characteristics. It, it's very much reasonable, I think, to assume, yes, that this man is going to be rather, um, rather imposing and, and worthy of note when compared to all the other soldiers. And so the fact that he appears in multiple accounts is, is very interesting. Um, and as well, we have the fact that they're armed with clubs and clubs and other weapons, 
which is very interesting as well, because that's not their military arms. They're not grabbing their muskets. They're not pulling out their bayonets, it seems. They're going with the express intention of, of doing harm, so to say. Because you can imagine if they're going around with their, with their arms, they probably have an officer with them. They probably have NCOs. This has probably like been sanctioned in some way because arms and accoutrements are, are very carefully kept track of so long as a regiment is well managed within its own interior. But by clubs, they're just grabbing whatever weapons they've got because this is completely, you know, mob violence. It basically the this military. Is personal. This, yeah, <laughs> this is a personal thing. This is this is just another mob. While Preston is making this dichotomy, as you pointed out, of you know military versus mob, this man is basically saying it's it's gang versus gang. You know, as you said, it's basically it's like gang violence. Absolutely. Uh, it's very interesting as well that they. They they had they as you say when they walk around even if they're not on duty like mm. they would have their sidearms uh, so the bayonet and the and the sword at least uh, they went back after getting beaten up and it, there would seem to be a a discrepancy on how many were originally beaten up Preston obviously wasn't there he's he's yes. he's talking second hand here this man apparently saw it mm -hmm. um, but uh, so there may have been more soldiers than just two but. It yes, very true, very true. Um, but um, they seem to be, there's a lot of people working at the rope walks it would, anyway, and they get beaten up and they go back to their barracks and they don't grab the their, their, their government issued weapons to go and fight these people. They, they grab weapons that you would use in a brawl, not in an official capacity almost, yeah. so that they can't basically almost get it wrong for using their swords and bayonets. Mm -hmm. To, that, that might give lend an official kind of the British Army is fighting here if I use my government issued yeah. weapons. Hmm. Interesting. So maybe a sense on the part of the soldiers that there's there are levels to the violence. Like there's a, there's a distinction that can be made between government sanctioned violence, like this is an action on the part of our officers, versus. Uh, versus just settling an issue, just settling an affair, some settling, like you said, personal honor. Actually, yeah, that's a that's a very interesting concept. I hadn't considered that one in particular. Because they have weapons that they presumably know how to use. So why are they picking up clubs and things like yeah. that? Yeah, per I mean, perhaps where they're getting them from, for heaven's sake. But <laughs> that that too. Um, that too, and even the fact that they are able to procure what presumably at least like what 30 clubs, if there's 40 or 50 people there, at least 30, I imagine something, you know, some great number of clubs. They probably don't just find these things on the street. They're probably like, oh, here's a stick. Uh, here you go. Here, Tim, you get this one here, Bob, you get this stick. No, they have these things ready, presumably, or at the very least, they know where they can readily procure them because this is all in the same day. And I imagine what, do you know how long this event all took place? It probably course of a few you know no more than a few hours i imagine between when they forenoon of friday so before 12 or something is that definitely you know not a very long period of time is passing by yeah the, the account when... of uh, john fisher says between 11 and 12 so there you go. So, so within an hour, you have this initial brawl, and then these guys are all able to not only get their entire company with them, including the drummer, they're able to find weapons and then go out with the intent of settling a personal score. It's like, it, it gives you a sense that this is, in fact, a pretty regular occurrence, and that, yeah, maybe if, if the military, as far as its members are concerned, and potentially even the non-commissioned officers who are the men in charge of the discipline of the soldiery, they're not looking at this as... We're not taking official action. This is just a couple of guys. This is what men do. They brawl. They fight. That's natural. Even the drummer's like, oh, I'm just here to watch. It, yeah, it gives a sense of, like, regularity in a way. Mm -hmm. It's, it's just very common. It's been going on for ages. And I'm, I'm curious, to be honest, I'm, I'm very, no, I'm not curious. I'm very suspicious that the NCOs, mm -hmm. like, the, the soldiers came back to the barracks and said, we just got insulted and called thieves by this bunch yeah. of nobodies down by the rope walk. You know, what, what should we do about it? And I'm very suspicious that some NCOs pretty much said, we're going to get the company together and we're going to show these guys. Yeah, I mean, because that, that is a pretty high level of organization. And either there's like some senior private who is just really, just yeah. really charismatic in that company or even a number. Again, it's probably more than one company worth of men because oftentimes these forces were not at full strength. And on paper, a company is around 50 guys. Um, 
Yeah, no, they're, they're probably at least a couple of corporals, let alone probably a sergeant or two at this meeting place where they go back to find all these guys. The officers are housed elsewhere usually. You know, yeah. they're probably going to hear about this after the fact and be like, come on, guys, really? But, um, yeah. but yeah, yeah, we have this situation where the NCO, at least one or two, are probably, if not at least like looking the other way, potentially helping to organize this, which yeah. does give more of a sense of official capacity, even though it's not meant to be. It's, yeah, it, um, yeah. You, you can really see, um, particularly I dare say, given um, current, you know, civic strife, how, how news of this kind of activity and, you know, the fact that people are not only reading these accounts, but they're painfully aware of what this looks like. You know, you and I, we read this account and we, and we draw these, you know, conjectures and we, and we draw these conclusions based off of our own historical knowledge and all the other accounts and everything. But when, when someone on the streets is reading this account, it's like, well, they, they probably seen that drummer. They probably know that company of men. They probably, they see this stuff happening in, you know, first person. It has much more of not only a, a logical connection, they're able to draw these connections themselves, but also an emotional connection. And you can really see how dramatically this does uh, basically, um, how to say, uh, degenerate the overall narrative. It, it makes things just worse overall for everyone involved. But if you if you read through the wealth of stuff on the Boston Massacre, it's very personal. People are actually identifying by sight. Yeah. Not only people, civilians that they know or have seen in town, mm -hmm. but soldiers at the same time. Yeah. Well, the the one was um, who was a gentleman. One of them was uh, one of the soldiers. I think it said the first one that was knocked down was involved in this earlier brawl. Is that correct? Uh, oh, uh, actually, yeah. The, the Preston says that the guy who owned the rope walk. Is one of the guy, one of the people who were killed. Ah, uh, okay. So there you go, right there. I mean, even right off the bat. Um, but Preston not, not knows only, this guy. Yeah. Not, not only is it is it drawing that again connection for how personal all is, but immediately in the eyes of you know of Boston after this affair, they're gonna hear about that. Oh yeah, and the guy who was earlier you know beaten by the soldiers. Yeah. Then they shot him. It's like, yeah. okay, great. Maybe you you get a sense that if the city were much larger. And if maybe these personal connections weren't quite so strong, that this wouldn't be as big of a deal. But uh, uh, again, at this particular time, let me see if I can pull up the exact statistic. So it, it, it's worthy of note, and this is from other research, from, from other sources and whatnot, Wikipedia, you know, it's just rough statistics, so very, very rough figures. But generally speaking, uh, when the British Army initially arrives in Boston, you know, you have that great uh, Paul Revere uh, sketch or, um, or a print or whatever of, of the soldiers marching down the long wharf. Uh, th there are about 4,000 regulars that were initially sent into the city. And uh, those numbers fluctuate over time. Some regiments go here, some regiments come in. You know. It's not exactly, you know, the number during the events that we're talking about today. But just to give you a sense, again, very, very overarching, very, very broadly, when those initial 4,000 regular soldiers arrive in the city, the population of Boston is like under 20,000. It's like 15,000 something, roughly speaking, people. At the initial arrival, they represent, yeah, about 25% of Boston's original 15,000 population. So you can imagine how dramatically that, imagine, you know, the viewer back at home, imagine walking out on the streets and one in every four people that are just walking around are in a military uniform. And you tell me that that doesn't immediately escalate tensions, let alone when you have stories like this fluttering all around the place. This is an immensely personal affair for all of these people. And you cannot, you cannot remove that from the events that are taking place. Is that, you know, as much as these are political events, as much as these are inspired by, you know, very high-minded ideals of representation and tax rights and, and uh, military occupation and defense and expenditure, it's also very much a personal affair, is that, you know, in the end, uh, you know, Boston, which is economically suffering a great deal at this time, you have a quarter of the, po uh, the population is expanded by like 25% overnight, and these soldiers start taking jobs in the city, they start taking up like economic space, if you will, they start clamoring even for physical space in the city, and then all of a sudden, you know, brawls become commonplace and, and you can imagine I don't remember actually there's one instance I'm afraid that I forget the exact instance uh, the exact uh, r title or the name but um there's even a brawl involving officers uh, officers going like to some to some uh um brothel in uh in in um on whore's oh, what's it called um 
Whore's Mountain? No, it was uh, Mount Hordom. They're going to this brothel at Mount Hordom, and apparently they just get raving drunk, and they're mooning people and flashing people as they're walking down the street and everything. They're making fools of themselves. And even something like that has nothing to do with the politics, but that affects the overall image. Because now all of a sudden, when you see, you know, not necessarily Captain Preston, I don't want to besmirch, besmirch his name in this way, but yeah, you know, you see, you know, th uh, some, you know, tension rising between these souls on the street, and all of a sudden it's like, well, hey, I don't care about the politics, but that's the guy who mooned my wife. Well, there you go. These are these personal tensions, these personal struggles and affairs are bleeding into and becoming interwoven with the political struggles, which is not a good thing. Oftentimes, it never leads to anything good. Um, you know, in the same exact way that, again, I, I don't want to to speak too much on modern day civic concerns, which are obviously very, very different, but. At the very least, from our perspective, maybe we can get some semblance of a connection with, you know, if we if we hear about, you know, uh, say an officer and a civilian who are involved in a dispute, and it's found out that they have a history with each other of some sort, that they knew each other, or that they had fought before, or even that they were best friends, whatever it is, imagine that, like, everyone, every soldier and every civilian, you know, they have a tendency to have connections with each other. They do, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's even, like... Other bits throw away. We, I, I, I mean, we can't read them all and stuff like that, but the, it's Fortune. clear. Yeah, it's clear that actually soldiers were working in the town of Boston. Yeah. You know, they yeah. had jobs yeah. exterior to their uh, work as soldiers, uh, you know, their duties, but they were gaining extra money in different places in Boston. So they were woven into the, 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 the tapestry of daily life. Mm -hmm. um, you would, it would be, as you say, these men, these soldiers in their red coats, are uh, a daily uh, sight. Yeah. It's impossible that you might that one in that out of those uh, uh, one in whatever it was for five people yeah. would not actually personally know or have had interaction. Maybe mm -hmm. even if not socially, uh, just as you walk, walk past them or something like yeah. that, or if you see them in a bar or if you go to the shop, like, where they almost work. an omnipresent, you mm -hmm. know, reminder, so to say. Yeah, and these are the men who are, the, and the army are the police uh, in, yeah. in this time as well. You know, they're the law and order if if things get out of hand. Like you, you have your local, you know, uh, night watchman, as it were. You know, you have the people that you're used to dealing with if there's ever any sort of concern, like the local, the local police, if you will. Uh, but then you have all of a sudden, you know, soldiers stopping people in the middle of the night, asking them about their business. And, you know, if you're looking out your window, you'd be like, well, well, that's all old Miss Sally. She's just, she's going on her nightly walk. That's what she does. And now she's getting accosted is, you know, these people aren't familiar with the local traditions and whatnot. So they're imposing, you know, it, it, it's, it's a whole other structure that's going to just crumble away the foundation of, of good relations between these populations. And so I think that... Uh that really does inform a lot of the tensions that are, uh, in, are present in Boston uh, mm. in 1770, early 1770, uh, as you uh, get moving towards uh, the, the night of the, the 5th. Mm. And um, on that day itself, there's another scrap uh, that uh, in the depositions they refer to as the Cornhill Affray, which happens, I don't know, an hour or two almost earlier um, at uh, some point during the day earlier, uh, and it might be worth looking at that too, because I just thought it was really interesting that there was actually this kind of um, uh, brawling uh, between, uh, again, a similar dynamic where a bunch, it seems a bunch of soldiers armed with clubs and things go out and, and try and beat up a bunch of people um, in the streets. Uh, these These testimonies say that this is kind of like and another example of the gang nature, where this time the soldiers are going out just to go and beat up people. Hmm. Um, so they're not even being provoked, but they are actively looking for something, you know, out of, out of boredom, perhaps because one person got affronted earlier and he's like, oh, you know, let's just go and show those, you know, yeah. colonists what's for. Um, and you can imagine, you know, infinite possibilities of how these kinds of things arise. But at the end of the day, it's a group of soldiers going out to try and, you know, seek something out. I mean, it speaks as well to uh, an element in all the depositions, some of the depositions, especially the, the, the anti-soldier ones, mm -hmm. where they where they say that this is a deliberately thought up, this massacre was a deliberately mm -hmm. thought up, um, yeah. uh, 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 you know, murder, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, 
where uh, and they used the Cornhill affray uh, as the that this instigate this was to instigate a riot essentially yeah. or or to get troublemakers onto the streets. Mm -hmm. now, I don't know uh, how there's no I don't know of a way of like trying to check from I mean, British sources what what this yeah. was, but uh, certainly Preston also is of the opinion on the other hand. That the, the the townspeople are also trying to deliberately instigate some sort of a, uh, an incident. And you can imagine the exact incident, which would likely be on the rumor mill, the gossip mill, uh, as those couple hundred thousand, whatever it is, people are going out that day to the ringing of the bells and the shooting of guns on the, uh, the later in the evening of yeah. the fifth, the Boston massacre itself. So we have um, uh, number thirty-two, Jeremiah Belknap of lawful age testifies and says that on the first appearance of the affray in Cornhill on Monday evening, the fifth instant, hearing a noise, he ran to his door and heard Mr. William Merchant say he had been struck by a soldier and presently saw to the number of eight or nine soldiers come out of Boylston's Alley into the street, armed with clubs and cutlasses. The deponent went out and up into the street and desired them to retire to their barracks, upon which one of them, with a club in his hand and cutlass in the other, with the latter made a stroke at the deponent. When finding there was no prospect of stopping them, the deponent ran to the main guard and called for the officers of the guard. The reply was, there is no officer here. Several of the soldiers came out of the, of the guardhouse, and the deponent told them if there was not a party sent down, there would be bloodshed. Just as the deponent spoke these words, he was attacked by two soldiers with drawn cutlasses, supposed of the party from Murray's barracks, one in his breast uh, and the other over his head. One of the guards said, this is an officer, meaning the deponent, I believe a constable, on which the two assailants retired and put up their cutlasses, and further saith not. Jeremiah Belknap. Uh, number 33. I, John Coburn, of lawful age, do testify and say that on the evening of the 5th of March instant, being alarmed by the cry of fire and ringing of bells, ran out of my house with my bags and bucket. Upon going to Mr. Payne's door, he told me it was not fire, it was a riot. I sent my buckets home again and went to Mr. Amory's corner with Mr. Payne, and Mr. Walker, the builder, came along, and said the soldiers were in the street in Cornhill in Dock Square, with their drawn cutlasses, cutting and slashing every body in their way, and the inhabitants wanted help, and said, pray gentlemen, run, or words to that purpose. I returned again to my house, and a few minutes after, at the head of Royal Exchange Lane in the street, I saw a few, not exceeding fifteen or twenty perhaps, stop, as I suppose, talking about what had happened. Uh, I went to Mr. Payne's door and stood in his entry with him, I believe about ten or fifteen minutes, and heard some words with the people and the sentinels, such as, Do fire if you dare! Uh, but no further than words, not so much as to touch him as I saw, uh, neither did I see more than five or six that had so much as sticks in their hands, all entirely unarmed without any weapons. Mr. Harrison Gray came into the entry to us, and, uh, and upon this immediately came an officer, with a party of six or seven men, with their guns breast high, and cleared the way, and by their behavior I did not know but they would fire. I said it was not prudent to tarry there, went directly into my house, and called all my family in. To the best of my judgment, there was not more than 50 or 60 people in the street when the party came, and I believe it was not exceeding two minutes from the time that I left Mr. Payne to the firing of the guns. John Coburn. Very interesting accounts again. Um, the first one in particular paints a very clean image overall in a way that very much reminds me of Preston's account, um, because he paints it like, hey, look, I was just walking down the street and what I, I saw that some guy had been hit. He'd been struck by a soldier, probably severely. Um, and then I saw eight or nine soldiers you know, just coming out of an alley. And they're all armed not only with clubs, but with cutlasses, which is very interesting because a cutlass, unless you're like a, a grenadier, you know, even for an earlier time period, like, no, having a sword, uh, infantry, you know, Officers might have hangers, but a cutlass, that's a, that's a navy thing, really. Um, soldiers don't get cutlasses and swords. They get their bayonets. Uh, officers and NCOs and sergeants and whatnot get their, get their swords. Uh, the fact that they're there at all is, is very interesting. Again, speaking to what we were talking about earlier as far as men procuring their own weapons. Um, 
But he says that after he sees these soldiers, he very, very bravely, incidentally, this deponent just runs out and says, hey guys, go back home. What are you doing? This is too much. Go, please, no, no more. Uh, after which one of the soldiers, not even bothering to negotiate, just runs out and just hits the guy, you know, just strikes at him. Very, very cruel, very mouse when he's just trying to, you know, find a peaceful resolution to this horrible struggle in the streets. Um, and then when he realizes as a result of being struck, well, this is hopeless. Then he goes over to the guardhouse and he's like, we need an officer, any officer. I'm like, there aren't any officers here. And then they hit him again. And then finally they're like, oh no, hey, I think this guy is important. Oh, all right. You know, and, and then he's able to make his escape. It's like, wow, you know, is, 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 is this, you know, some, you know, 1940s uprising? You know, what, what kind of a situation are we looking at here? Um, he, he paints not just an image of the soldiers, you know, going out looking for trouble, but like not even putting that much thought into it, just hitting people, attacking people in the streets, you know, at random. Um, you know, while Preston's account is like kind of extreme in one end, it seems this account, at least it, it strikes me as being, you know, a little bit too perfect with the overall narrative. Mm. So to speak. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, on a couple of counts, I mean, the fact that, I mean, it's not only, first of all, that with the cutlass is a very strange wording. Um, yeah. It stands out uh, a mile away because um, it's just not something you associate with the army. And yeah. in the 18th century, in the 18th century, a cutlass, I mean, I, I've been trying to think about it. It, it, it could mean because in the 18th century cutlass was not just one sword it was a it was mm -hmm. like a type of sword it was a thick okay. bladed thing short that you could use on a ship basically okay and it could come in various various types of so so you you might say that an an infantry hanger can fit into that but do you think maybe a shorter blade like a like do you think something like a like a like a very long knife could apply to the term or a dirk or something i mean it could yeah it's it's because... just I mean, you can see how, you know, just a number of, a variety of blades then uh, could belong, you know, it's something like that they're yeah. using for, for work, you know, for regular just tasks. Um, yeah. Yeah, and that would make a little bit more sense, I suppose, along the line of them, you know, uh, having cudgels, which are very, you know, rudimentary weapons. Um, even still, though, it's very interesting. As far as I'm aware, a cutlass is not one, like, just one type of blade. If you look at it, okay. another one would be completely different in this time, as far as I'm aware. I think okay. maybe the Navy had a cut, like a pattern, maybe, yeah. but I... But that's just their pattern cutlass, and yeah. there's a, it, it's sort of like saying, you know, a, well, like a, like a patent, you know, um, well, it's like a patent blade, I suppose you can say. Yeah. There's, okay, so that, that makes a lot more sense than overall, if it's just these guys have, you know, large blades of some sort or other. Uh, still rather terrifying. Yes, I would think so, yeah. The other thing is, of course, that he... He, uh, I mean, he doesn't give a particular reason, as far as I've ever seen uh, so far, anyway. Everything that refers to the Cornhill affray uh, ha doesn't give a motive for why these soldiers are in the street. Uh, and obviously Preston uh, is of the opinion that there's a concerted movement, of course, to to defame the garrison in Boston. Mm. On the other hand, uh, uh, Bostonians, certain Bostonians, are of the opinion that there is an active attempt by the garrison of Boston to cause to to I don't know what what on earth would the even the motive be for the garrison to cause trouble like that officially? Again, in an official capacity, really, there isn't, unless it's some, you know, if you want to get, like, really conspiratorial, like, oh, the officers haven't had a fight in a long time, but if they can make a war, then they'll have a chance for promotion. But, you know, you can rapidly go all sorts of crazy uh, with it. Uh, I, I think, again, yeah, a, a lot of these um, occasions are, I, I think, stemming from, from personal cause. You know, it's not the military trying to instigate something. It's maybe not even the majority of civilians trying to instigate something, although there are very clearly uh, politically unified elements behind it, which are seizing these instances and spinning them in a very clear narrative. But I, I think a lot of them, I'm getting a sense, are, are again very personally inspired. These are personal affronts. These are personal affrays. And these are personal personal brawls between guys getting a bunch of their buddies and beating up another guy and all of his buddies, you know, on one side or the other. Uh, but then, of course, you know, you're able to take those individual 
you know, vaguely isolated in sense. Obviously, they're all connected because they have the similar theme of the occupation, but things that are not necessarily politically inspired, and you're able to drag them out and put together an overarching narrative of look at what's happening. Because, because indeed, there is a trend here of violence between the populations. Uh, and, and you are able to utilize the, that for much, uh, well, shall we say, much deeper, much larger purposes, again, for, for ill or not. There's definitely as well, uh, I mean, if, uh, some, of them want, some of them talk specifically that the Sons of Liberty are behind the, um, the like the civilian violence. Yeah. Um, and one guy at least absolutely just says, I know people in the Sons of Liberty talking about we're going to we're going to fix them up. Um, whereas other ones said similar about the soldiers. But what's interesting as well about the second uh, the second deposition you read then, his leads directly into the situation of the Boston Massacre, and he pretty much shuts the door as as things mm -hmm. are about to kick off. Yeah, um, very convenient for his part. Yeah, <laughs> it's interesting as well that the, the first one, the first guy, goes running to find an officer mm -hmm. to try and to try and control the situation. Why there is no officer that he finds is interesting, and I suppose that mm -hmm. that lends an air of conspiracy to it. Yeah, in a way, like, like there is well, a where, little... where was he then? Why wasn't he present? Or, or even, you know, was he really there and he's just refusing to see this person because he doesn't care or whatever? It, yeah, it, be, because it's not, you know, actually answered, it does. It leaves the mind to wonder all these things. And, you know, if you're already in a position of really hating these guys' guts, well, you're going to assume the worst. worst. Yeah. Uh, and it's interesting, pretty much. I mean, a lot of the depositions contradict each other quite abruptly, especially when it gets into the actual what happened uh, when the shoot when the shooting starts, and uh, in the in the trial minutes and and notes taken by um, by uh, John Adams and and the the defense part the defense team that defends mm -hmm. the press Prescott uh, Preston and his soldiers. Mm -hmm. Basically, a lot of it is like a lot of the a lot of them lead with pretty much. So there is a great deal of contrary opinion, and the witnesses yeah. are diverse in their opinions as to mm -hmm. what happens. And there's one really funny bit where he goes, um, you know, either this person was stone blind, or had such a great imagination that allowed him to see this, and nobody yeah. else saw it. <laughs> Well, okay, not to sound too much like some sort of a game show host here, but I think we've probably uh, taken up enough of uh, these good people's time as we can yes, uh, yes, legitimately uh, ask for this video. Uh, so uh, we, we'll, call, we'll call an end to it here. Um, but why don't you go uh, pop across to Brandon's channel? Where make, no, make, make, no, sorry, make sure you do. <laughs> go over to Brandon's channel and see part two of uh, this of this video where we will continue talking about the Boston Massacre and unpacking some of its most interesting accounts.